In the words of Elia Kemmler, I have always wanted to believe, really believe, that our mistakes aren't the most important parts of us. I've always wanted to believe that kindness and compassion matter more than anything, and I sense that I can learn that here. There's a joke that I told some version of in church every single year in the fall for the past 17 years. I usually tell it around the time of Yom Kippur, and I say something to the effect of, I'm always glad that Yom Kippur, the Jewish High Holy Day of Atonement and Forgiveness, happens each year early in the fall, because by the time we're about six weeks into the church year, I know that I've messed up and need a little forgiveness. And actually, Yom Kippur is not for another four weeks, and we're going to do a, we're going to do a special multi-generational service for that. I'm just choosing to tell the joke earlier this year, and you shouldn't read anything into that. And the service, the service is not about forgiveness per se, but it is about a lot of the things that inhabit the same constellation. It is about failures and mistakes, and things that don't go the way you dreamed and hoped and imagined they would. It is about not getting it right, it's about vulnerability and admitting what we do not know. It is about being less than perfect. It isn't easy being perfect. I should know. I just wanted to say that one. Let me rephrase that. It isn't easy being a perfectionist. I do know. Has anyone here, anyone else ever wrestled with perfectionism? Ever wrestled with some external voice demanding perfection from you? Or, as is perhaps more commonly the case, have you ever wrestled with an internal voice that tells you that making mistakes is unacceptable, that you are not acceptable if you are not perfect? I'm not the only person here this morning who's struggled with perfectionism, am I? And if you've never experienced it yourself as a personal struggle, within your soul, chances are you probably know somebody who does. Maybe a partner or a spouse, maybe a sibling or a child, maybe a friend or a co-worker. You probably know. You probably have someone in your life who is a perfectionist. Whenever I write a sermon, I tend to begin by doing two things. One of the first things I do is sort of a brainstorm. What do I have to say about this particular topic? I do a little bit of free association and call to mind stories and poems and texts and personal experiences and so forth that I might draw upon to share. But I also do a second thing when I prepare a sermon. And the second thing that I do is that I take a mental inventory of the congregation. Who am I in dialogue with on this topic? Now, don't get me wrong. As I write the sermon, it's not like I'm imagining that I'm talking to specific people. It's not like George Thompson really needs to hear a sermon about perfectionism. <laughs> George, George is in on that joke. He volunteered to be my guinea pig. But when I did that mental scan, that, that heart scan of the congregation, I realized that one of the things that I want to say to you towards the beginning of this year is that not everything we do this year is going to work. Not everything will go according to plan, and that's okay, because that's the way it is. That's how it always is and always will be. I have to tell you, I, I simultaneously love the reading I selected at the same time that it makes me quite uncomfortable. Unitarian Universalist minister Alea Kemmler describes a service where everything goes wrong, the orders of service are a mess, the flower situation is awkward, the elements of the service are taken out of order. The music director plays the wrong hymn. It is a fiasco. And when I hear that reading, I think, I'm so mortified. If that happened to me, I could never show my face. When I hear that reading, I also get a little judgmental. They should really clean up their act over there. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist, after all. But this year, together, the order of service may be always correct or not. The parts of the service may happen in the right order or not, but there will be things that do not go well. 
And I'm not just talking about the everyday things, the rooms that get double booked, or the meetings that half the committee forgets to attend, or the sermons that don't manage to come together. Because there will be sermons that don't manage to come together. I'm talking about social justice initiatives that people put their hearts into, but that lead to confusion or disappointment or pain. I'm talking about things that are said or done with the loftiest of intentions, only for us to discover that the impact is that someone was harmed. And so as we enter into this church year, we would do well to remember a few mantras that are mine, that I learned to say. And I'm going to invite you to say them with me. To err is human. Not everything will go according to plan. Not everything will go according to plan. The church is a laboratory for learning and growth. The church is a laboratory for learning and growth. God's people are flawed people. God's people are flawed people. We know we're dancing when we step on someone's toes. <laughs> and nothing we do will be perfect. So that's the first part of the sermon. Not everything will go smoothly or perfectly here at church this year. And if you are a part of a school or a business or a group outside of here, those mantras will probably also have, uh, those mantras will probably be true there as well. But I do wonder, I do wonder if I might try to go a little bit deeper into this question of perfectionism. See, as I was thinking about this topic, about what I had to say about it, a vivid and powerful memory came to mind. It was probably not the moment I became a perfectionist, but it was the moment I developed a consciousness of perfectionism. It was the moment I developed the logic of perfectionism. It was the moment where I chose perfectionism. I remember it vividly. And all these years later, I'm still surprised that I can remember it so vividly. It was in fifth grade math class. I was 10 years old. We were learning long division. And somehow, I understood long division in a way that I understood nothing else in math, before or since. <laughs> We had worksheets with problems we were supposed to be working on answering at our desks in silence. And the teacher, the teacher was going around the class, sitting down with the students who were having difficulty with the concept and working with them on the problems. And it was at that moment in that fifth grade math class that I had an epiphany. I thought to myself, if I get all the answers correct, perfectly, then the teacher will not sit down with me. So I did all these problems, and sure enough, the teacher went around the room and passed me by after glancing at my sheet, stopping instead at the desk of the person sitting next to me who was, in fact, struggling with long division. And the consciousness that I had in the moment, the logic was this. If you are perfect, if I am perfect, that perfectionism can be wielded like a shield or a barrier. It means people won't get in my business. It means I'll be left alone. And it's actually more than that. It is a mask or a disguise that I can wear, a means of passing in the world, where who I am is different from what people see. A lot of people imagine that perfectionism is just about having really high standards, about being really hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. But I don't think that is perfectionism's essence. At its essence, I believe perfectionism has less to do with this idea of the self and more to do with attempting to control how others perceive and interact with you. It has less to do with the integrity of the self, and more to do with being able to control or attempt to control how others perceive and interact with you. 
My logic of perfectionism was as such. If I could demonstrate perfection here, I could control how I was perceived as well as the terms on how others interacted me. It was a shield, a mask, a way of controlling how the world interacted with me. Perfectionism, in that sense, involved the development of a split consciousness, a perfect external shell, which is how the world sees you, and then there is that gooey internal center, how you really are, filled with your vulnerabilities and weaknesses and warts and tender parts and imperfections and all of that. When I wrote up the blurb for this sermon, I included a link to an article by my esteemed colleague and friend, Reverend, Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd. The title of the article, like the title of my sermon, is Nothing We Do Will Be Perfect. And she does, Nancy does, this really brilliant and perceptive thing in her article. She writes primarily about race and class and how in her experience, middle class white people as a group tend to perform perfectionism, perform being knowledgeable, perform being right, perform having our stuff together, Nancy uses a different word for stuff. Perform having our stuff together as a way of setting up a barrier, an us and a them. But what if, she asks, and what if I ask, what if what worked so well for me in fifth grade math class? And to tell you the truth, works in a lot of other places in my life, in, in school and in parts of my professional life and in social networks, what if that doesn't actually work in other parts? What if it doesn't work well at all in relational social justice work? What if it doesn't work as well in mutual partnership? What if it doesn't work as well in terms of our spiritual growth? What if we, in fact, need cracks in that perfect exterior so that the light can get in? So I'll tell you, as a person, one of the things that I kind of struggle with and have struggled with for years and years is the attempt to let go of that perfectionism, to suppress that perfectionism, to allow myself actually to be a little bit more vulnerable and messy and gooey, especially in relational social justice work and mutual partnership and spiritual growth. What if we had the ability to practice imperfection right here in this place? To err is human. Not everything will go according to plan. The church is, in fact, a laboratory for learning and growth. God's people are flawed people. We know we're dancing and we step on toes. Nothing we do will be perfect. I want to close the sermon part with the words of Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is the executive director of the Equal Justice Institute and works um, getting people freed from death row. He is also the creator of the Memorial to Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. And hear these words by Brian Stevenson about the gift of imperfection. He writes, I do what I do because I am broken too. And the truth is, if you get proximate to pain and suffering, if you do uncomfortable things, it will break you. But I also realize, he writes, that there is a power in that brokenness, for it is the broken among us who can teach us the way compassion works. It is the broken who understand the power of mercy. It is the broken who understand the power of justice. It is the broken that yearn for redemption. It is the broken who yearn for reconciliation. It is the broken who need to teach us how we love despite our brokenness. And it's in brokenness that I realize I'm not just fighting for the condemned. I'm fighting, in fact, for myself. I've always wanted to believe, really believe that our mistakes are not the most important parts of us. I've always wanted to believe that kindness 
and compassion matter more than anything. I sense that I can learn this here. I sense that we can learn this here. Amen. And now for the message from the minister, which you all are curious about. So the words by Brian Stevenson are actually a perfect transition to the next part of the service, because I want to make a special announcement that I call your attention to. Last spring, during my Easter sermon, I threw out an idea, a challenge, a dream, a fantasy. I said, wouldn't it be awesome if we took a church trip to the Equal Justice Institute's Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama? That's the Brian Stevenson link. And later that week, I got an email from Joy Blevins. Joy had been a member of our church for just a month at that point. Joy said, Tom, please connect me with the team working on planning this pilgrimage. <laughs> I said, Joy, you are the team planning this pilgrimage. And she did not run screaming. Joy then connected with Mariana Fiorentino and Melva Oaken, and together they took a version of this trip. To Joy, Joy you're in the back. Would you, would you stand up just so people can see who you are? Since There's Joy. All right. It's Joy. Joy connected with Mariana and Melva who took a version of this trip to Montgomery and Selma in August to kind of scout it out. And then they enlisted the help of Terry Brooks, and then they enlisted the help of Ruth Gibson. And here are a few things that you should know. I met with Joy, Mariana, and Melba when they returned. And they returned on fire, inspired, changed, profoundly moved, and transformed by this experience. They said, oh, Tom, we're not taking a trip. This is a pilgrimage. This is a journey to sacred space. Connection with a sacred story it will require that the people who decide to go do some preparation, some study, some learning, and some breaking our hearts open and becoming vulnerable so that we can learn. And so this morning, amidst all of the inserts that you have, so many inserts, there is a yellow one. It is a half a piece of paper. But I want to tell you, and I can witness to this, that there was a lot of work that went into this half a piece of paper. There was hours and hours of contacting other groups that have done the trip to ask for itineraries and recommendations. There were hours and hours of calling bus companies and hotels to get price estimates. And so this morning, my announcement is that I want to invite you to honor the work of this fearless team by letting them know if you have a significant interest in going. Because that will determine whether or not they can plan the trip or not. So you can fill it out. You can give it a standing on the side of love table during coffee hour. If you need time to consult with your calendar or your, your beloved or to, to see if you need to set up dog sitting for that day or whatever, you can, you can turn it in next week. But the team would be very, very, very grateful to be able to know if there's interest so that they can go deeper in their planning. Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn this morning, Though I May Speak With Bravest Fire. It's number 34, and I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together. Mm -hmm. 